Good morning. It's a beautiful spring day. And welcome to the northwest region of the Johannesburg Church of Christ. It's such a privilege to be together and to know that where two or more are gathered, there Jesus is present. We are here today to worship the Ancient of Days, who lives in unapproachable light and paid the ultimate price to be directly connected to us so that we no longer have to approach priests and offer sacrifices. What a privilege. Let's prepare our hearts to worship him. Sarah Rose will read us a scripture. I will be reading from Psalm 40, verse 1 to 3. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock. He gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Let us pray together. Almighty Father in heaven, thank you that we may approach your throne of grace with confidence this morning. We pray that you would soften our hearts and make them open to your word that our hearts would be fertile soil, so that all of your words will bear fruit in our lives. God, make us like Peter. Jesus told him to feed the sheep if he loved him. And make us like Paul. He said his goal was to ensure that the disciples were united in love and encouraged in heart. Help us to grow and do your will in our lives, Father, and bless the service as you reveal yourself to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Are you guys ready for some happy clappies? Yes. <laughs> okay. We're going to sing a series of medleys. The words will appear on the projector, and you can just follow us, follow us the song leaders. Amen. Amen. I've been redeemed. I've been redeemed. By the blood of the Lamb. Blood of the Lamb, I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, filled with the Holy Ghost I am, all my sins are washed away, I've been redeemed, hell I went down, to the river to pray, well I went down. I felt so good, I stayed all day. All my sins are washed away, I've been redeemed. And that's not all. And that's not all. There's more besides. There's more besides. And that's not all. There's more besides. And that's not all. There's more besides. I've been to the river and I've been baptized. All my sins are washed away, I've been redeemed. Well, I said I wasn't going to talk about it, but I no, I, no, I, I said I wasn't going to talk about it, but I couldn't keep it to myself, but the Lord has done for me, you, you, you ought to have been there. About it, but I couldn't keep it to myself. Oh, I, I no, I couldn't keep it to myself. I said I wasn't gonna talk about it, but I couldn't keep it to myself. What the Lord has done for me, you, you ought to have been there. Jesus, save my soul. You ought to have been there. God. 
morning. Please turn your Bibles with me to Matthew 26, verse 39. There's a well-known metaphor. Half empty cup and a half full cup. It's just a perspective. It describes how people see things in their lives. Those who are see the cup being half empty, for them, life is on the negative things of, of life. It's misery, it's, you see the cup being half full, the lacking of the cup not being full, calamities, disaster. On the other hand, those who see the cup being half full, they see the Life being just a blessing after blessing. Things positive. Things are just, you're happy. God is on your side. Those are just two perspectives about life. Today I want to talk about the cup that Jesus begged God three times to be taken away from him. Let's go to Matthew 29, 26, verse 39. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed. We are in the Garden of Gethsemane hours before Christ is being going to be arrested. So he went with three of the disciples to go and pray. This is where we're picking up the story. My father, if it is possible... May this cup be taken for me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back again, he found them asleep because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time saying the same thing. For Christ, this cup is referring to is a cup of suffering, of agony, of pain, of knowing he's going to have to endure that suffering on the cross. Knowing that's going to be the sacrifice lamp for mankind. Obviously, he was not willing to do it. And he begged God three times to allow him to go to the motion, to take away the cup, the cup away from him. He knew, understand one thing, Christ knew that by him drinking that cup of suffering, it means that we don't have to go and get sacrificed ourselves. We will receive the cup of salvation through his cup of suffering. He also knew that the cup of suffering will be turned into a blessing. The blessing of mankind, of you and I being saved, of us receiving the cup of salvation. In the Old Testament, the cup is referred to as the cup of wrath and judgment from God. So Jesus knew very well that when he used this word cup, he's going to bring on upon himself a wrath and judgment. He's going to be judged for a sin that didn't, the sin he didn't commit, the judgment he didn't qualify for. He'd have to bury that. He understood that. 
and he was able to ask God to give him the strength as he was not able to take away the cup from him. In the same Old Testament, for King David, the cup has a different meaning. In Psalm 15, 16 verse 5, King David declares, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. Here David speaks about the blessings and recognize the good that God is going to come from God. He represents for him the fullness of God's abundance in his grace, in his love, and his protection. And he saw his future secured by God. Personally, I am a half full cup person. I see things always rosy, things always on a positive thing, side of things. But I need people in my life that can see the cup being half empty because they help me to be balanced and to see where the traps are, where I need to be aware of certain things. But we all are one way or the other wired. But today I want to talk about a third option. It's no longer about the cup being filled empty or filled full. It's about who holds the cup. And if we know that God is the one who holds the cup, whether it is filled with blessing or suffering, we know we can trust God because he's in control and he makes no mistakes. He knows exactly what we need at that present time and we need to trust him. It's going to take you to that trial or that time of happiness. So understand, the focus must change from the content of the cup to our faith in the one who fills in the cup. In times of blessing, we praise God. We thank him. He is our portion and he is our cup. In times of suffering, like for Jesus, we submit to God's will. Because like Christ knew, his suffering will become a blessing to other people at the later stage. We also know that our suffering will become a blessing one time or the other. Both God, uh, David's cup and Jesus' cup remind us that we need to trust God completely. Complete reliance on God in every season of our lives. We trust him in abundance and lean on him in suffering. As we partake now in the bread that reminds us of his body, and we take the cup where the juice is filled in, we remember it is his blood that was shed on the cross. Let us remember that in both blessings and hardship, we can call on God because he is our portion and our cup. Let us pray. Father in heaven, you are awesome. You are great. You are the almighty. Let us trust in you, God, in times of suffering and in time of blessing. Let us lean on you like we learn how Christ called upon you and begged you three times to take the cup away from him. But he was always trusting you that your will must be done. Let your will be done in our life, Father. Be a cup and a portion. We thank you. We pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
Good morning. Good to be together. And uh, if you are visiting with us for the first time, a warm welcome to you. We also want to welcome uh, Gerald and Kathy are visiting from our, our church in London. Where are they? Uh, maybe they got jet lag. <laughs> Who knows? Okay. Anyway. So that, thank you, Osima, for preparing our hearts and our minds for the communion. And this brings us to our time where we take up a contribution uh, like every Sunday. And uh, so for the last, for June, July, August, and September, the last Sunday of every of those four months, the, the Sunday contribution goes towards helping our kids get to kids camp at the end of the year. So today is the last Sunday where we can contribute towards that great cause. Um, so I want to read... Just two verses. I almost forgot my pin, <laughs> pin number. Um, so last time I shared a little bit of our, our trip to, uh, to, to the U.S. to go to the teachers' conference. Um, and then we were very lucky and very fortunate and very privileged to be able to be taken by Bill and Christian on a road trip from, from, uh, from L.A. to to Kansas City. And one of our stops, because that's a long drive, we had four nights where we stayed over at different places, and they told us they're going to show us the Grand Canyon. How many of you guys have been to the Grand Canyon? One. Okay, two, three, four. Four, okay. I'm sure you've seen photos of the Grand Canyon. Uh, you heard about it. I mean, we were, we were looking forward to this so much. It's just, I've heard it's just spectacular. And so we took a number of photos, and I went through those photos over the weekend to see which one will help you get the best idea of what this looks like. But um, I couldn't find a photo, so I'm going to play you a 20-minute clip. You know, you can hear about it, and you can read about it, and you can even look at photos of it, but once, if you, once you get there and you stand on the rim, it like takes your breath away, and it's one of those wow moments. This is much bigger and larger and more grand than I could ever imagine in my mind. And then we were able to walk. It was about a mile walk on this rim where we took photos, and there's lots of things that explains the history and what kinds of rocks are in the Grand Canyon, and it's just, it's just for an hour or two, it just keeps on taking your breath away, and you wow. And it, it, it reminded me of, or it made me think of, of God. You know, after 34 years, my first day at the conference was my 94th spiritual birthday. Ach, not 94th. <laughs> 34th spiritual birthday, okay? I'll get there, I'll get there. And I realized after 34 years of reading my Bible, listening to sermons, going to conferences, trying to figure out God, I, there's just so much more to still learn about God. And that God is far greater than I can even imagine. And so Job came to that conclusion one day in his life. After a long debate and arguing and trying to point his his side of the story, uh, Job got to the conclusion, he says in, in chapter 42, in verse 5, he says, I had only heard about you, God, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. This morning, as we take up a contribution I wonder when last you had a wow moment where you realized, wow, God, you are so amazing. 
Because we have a lot of moments where we question, where is God, right? And in our contribution is one way where we can show God our repentance. And where we can show God, I've still got so much to learn. But here's a little piece of what you've given to me to show you how much I appreciate how great and how grand our God is. Let's pray for the contribution. Holy God and Father, thank you so much for your creation. We know the Bible teaches that the stars and the heavens declare your name day after day. Nature shouts that you exist. God, and thank you for the experiences that we can go through where you help us to get to know you a little better. And as we, as we give of the money that we've worked for this last month, as we give some of that back to you, I pray that even this experience will help us to get to know you better. We love you. We thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so uh, God has been grace, gracious this week. We've, had, we've seen two people make the decision to make Jesus Lord of their lives. And uh, both from campus, and I want to call up Temba from UJ and Vilma from Wits. UJ and Wits. Great, great, great. Here we go. Uh, yeah, what a great decision. It's so encouraging for all of us, especially the older guys, the, gray, the gray-headed guys. We are so inspired by young men that makes this decision early on in your life where you can spare yourself so many heartaches and problems. I'm not saying there won't be any problems, but you're saving yourself a lot of unnecessary uh, heartaches and problems. So um, stand a bit closer so I can pray for you. The boys. Heavenly Father and God, thank you so much for your perfect plan of salvation. Thank you, God, that you've opened the eyes of these two young men's hearts so they could see you and experience your love and compassion and your kindness as they made Jesus Lord of their lives, as they decided to get baptized and wash their sins away, clothing themselves with Jesus. We pray as a family that we'll walk with them this long, sometimes lonely road until they see you again. We thank you for their lives. Thank you for this privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, just a reminder for the family group leaders, we'll have a meeting, um, let's say quarter to 12 till quarter to 1 in the chapel. So let's be, all be on time so we can start on time so we can finish on time so you can go feed your kids. Okay? Uh, then a reminder for our special contribution, uh, we don't have a barometer yet, but I think we're standing on about a third of our goal. We, we between five and 600,000 out of the 1.5 million, so we're just waiting for a few more people to put in their special contribution. And we'll give God glory for that. Those are all our announcements. Quick and easy today. Preteens, if we can ask you guys to move to your class. And the rest of us will stand. We'll have one more song. And then Jock will give us our second last class in the series on building stronger together. Okay. Please stand. We're going to sing one more song.
All right, so I think I'm on. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks, George. All right, it's great to be together. Thank you so much for making the decision to join us this morning. If you're visiting this morning wondering how on earth do you get to celebrate your 94th spiritual birthday and look like Ivor, uh, the church that believes in miracles, I guess. Um, but it's good to be together. You know, throughout the year, um, the evangelists and teachers throughout the Johannesburg Church have been traveling um, around uh, teaching in, in all the different regions under the banner of Build Together. And uh, we've decided to focus in on the books uh, tackling the post-exilic period. And uh, this morning, I um, have the privilege to dive into the book of Nehemiah. Now, it has 13 chapters. I probably have about 35 minutes, so you can already see the problem. Uh, but my prayer is that as we dive into it, that I would be able to take you through the narrative, make some observations that will prayerfully be relevant, uh, but also will prod us, prompt us, encourage us, remind us um, of what God wants to shape inside of us as we think about building together. So please turn your Bibles to Nehemiah. Uh, we will be there in a little bit. Now, interestingly, um, in our Bibles, the, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah are two separate books, but in the Hebrew heritage, it's actually one book, one combined book, and maybe you've heard this before as my colleagues have spoken about Ezra before. But a very important note um, to consider is that these are the last books in the Old Testament or in the Hebrew Bible narrating the history of Israel before we get to what many would call the intertestamental period. So what we're about to read is pretty much the last narrative or the last piece of the story before we get to uh, the gap between Old and New Testament. So where are we in the big story? Well, um, at the end of the 6th century BC, the kingdom of Judah was dismantled by the Babylonian Empire. Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed, and thousands of Judahites were exiled to Babylon. Those who were exiled, however, did not see this as the final stage in Israel's history. They were aware that Jeremiah prophesied and promised that they would be in exile, but also that the prophecy was there that they would return one day. And you can look at Jeremiah chapter 32, especially verse 26 down to 44. But the opportunity for that return came about 538 B.C., when the Babylonian Empire fell and the Persian Empire gained control of Mesopotamia and most of the Middle East. And one of the very first rulers of that empire, Cyrus, sought to show tolerance to all the communities in Mesopotamia. And he issued a famous edict that is narrated at the very beginning of the book of Ezra and also at the end of Second Chronicles, allowing the Jews who wished to return to Jerusalem and to build a house for the God of heaven to do so. So they were free to go back. And the book of Ezra and Nehemiah tells of the three distinct stages in the return from exile and of the challenges and practical difficulties that the returnees faced at each stage. Now, it's important to note that not all the Jews were excited to return, but those who did were fired by the hope of building a society which would restore Israel's ancient glory. So where we dive in today is really in stage three of that return, which spans across the book of Nehemiah, which is our focus for today. So let me take you to the end of that story in Nehemiah chapter 13. And let's read that together. Verse 23, we're right near the end. And this is out of Nehemiah's personal memoirs. And, uh, and it says, moreover, in those days, I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod or the language of one of the other peoples and did not know how to speak the language of Judah. I rebuked them and called curses down on them. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. I made them take an oath. In God's name, and I said, you are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, 
nor are you to take their daughters in marriage for your sons or for yourselves. And we'll just park it right there. This is at the end of the narrative. This is at the end of, of the story. Right? And what do we see? I, I think it's safe to say that we see a ticked off, angry, and frustrated Nehemiah that is going about calling down curses on people. I have never thought in my ministry life to do that for anyone, well, maybe now and again. <laughs> but he goes about, he rebukes them, and it literally says that he starts beating some of the men. Thank goodness, not the women. Otherwise, this hall would be a lot fewer individuals. But he pulls out their hair. I mean, this is how the narrative comes to a close. We'll get back to this a little bit later because you're wondering what on earth is going on here. But turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 1. You know, the story <clears throat> at the beginning of Nehemiah starts with incredible hope filled with tons of possibilities and opportunities. You know this very well if you've read the book. In, in verse 1, we meet, or we meet um, Nehemiah as the cupbearer to the king of Persia, Artaxerxes. And in verse 1, it says, The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakali, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and about Jerusalem. And they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then I said, and he launches into kind of a prayer that you are welcome to read. So we see a man that hears the report about the remnant that have found themselves in Jerusalem. And he hears the report that the walls have been broken down, the gates have been burnt, and that people are living in disgrace. And he is moved in heart. He is filled with, I think, probably a mixture of compassion and passion and and he, and he sits down, he weeps, he mourns for many days and fasts. And then he, he says this prayer, God, please help me as I approach this pagan king, Artaxerxes, because I'm about to make some requests. So he makes the requests to return to Jerusalem. And, uh, and this is just the way that God works, that the pagan king allows him. Not only does he allow him, he sends letters to help him to have safe passage. Not only does he give him letters to help him with safe passage, but he gives him everything that is needed to rebuild the walls and the gates. Pagan king. Very similar to Cyrus, what happened with Ezra and Zerubbabel when they returned. You know, in, in chapter 2, verse 8, what I do think Nehemiah and the narrator wants us to understand, it says, And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my requests that there was something going on here where God was on the move, that he was at work. Then a couple of verses later, in chapter 2, verse 10, you, you're going to have to keep your Bible open because I'm going to, there's no PowerPoint. You're going to have to look. We get introduced to the antagonists. Now, every good story has antagonists. And the antagonists in this story are two dudes called Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite. And when these guys heard, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. And this kind of sets in motion um, what really happens for the next number of chapters, that, um, that not only was it kind of a smooth ride, but opposition was part of rebuilding uh, and reestablishing this community back in Israel. So Nehemiah travels to Jerusalem. He sets out to inspect the wall. And after he's done that, he calls the group together and he says, let us rebuild the wall. And in verse 18 of chapter 2, everybody responds, yes, let us rebuild. And earlier this year, I did kind of a, a whole lesson on that picture where the story moves forward from there. And it focuses on how a group of people working together pulls off the rebuilding of the wall around Jerusalem in 52 days in the midst of opposition. Now, let me say a couple of things about opposition, because that definitely is a Bible study that you can do throughout the book of Nehemiah, and there's so much to learn. But there's a number of ways in which the chief antagonist 
Sambalat and Tobiah try to pull this group off course. One of them is sometimes they would ridicule them and insult them. They would say, what are these feeble Jews trying to do? Then they would even say, you know, if a small fox jumped on this wall, the wall would collapse. I mean, they don't know what they're doing. Just flat out insults. Then there were other moments where they started plotting and planning to physically come out and fight against them, to oppose them uh, from rebuilding what was going on in Jerusalem. And then when that didn't work, on one occasion, they tried to lure Nehemiah into a situation where they could discredit him. But here's the big takeaway. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 9, you could just kind of notice it there. Here's how Nehemiah dealt with the ongoing opposition as they embarked on this incredible project with God. It says, but we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. I love that balance. Where on the one side, uh, you know, there's, there's full reliance on God. You'll, you'll often see Nehemiah just break out in spontaneous praise saying, God, please frustrate their plans. God, please strengthen me and the builders. God, please. And, and they were prayerful. They were dependent on God because this is a God project. But then on the other side, they had a practical plan. They posted a guard day and night. You know, when they worked on the wall, some of the men, um, you know, worked and others carried weapons. You know, some worked and carried weapons. I mean, there was this practical plan to oppose whatever these antagonists wanted to do. And the story ends this part of it in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 16, where it says, when all our enemies heard about this, when they rebuilt the wall in 52 days, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. I love that. It was so clear to anybody that was opposed to this work when it was completed that this is a God thing. All the evidence is there, and it says that they lost all of their self-confidence, and they became afraid. The story moves on, and I want you to turn to chapter 8. We're going to read some together to what I believe is the climax of the book of Nehemiah, because the focus was not only to rebuild or construct a wall and a temple, but was to somehow reignite the spiritual life and the identity of this community. And that brings us to chapter 8, verse 1. It says, when the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. So even the kids were there that were able to listen. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood, and there's a list of names that you are welcome to try and pronounce. Verse 5, Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen! Amen! Then they bowed down and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. See, I have this group settled. It's the seventh month. And um, they built a platform. I don't know how big it was, but maybe a little bit like this, maybe a little bit more elevated. And the invitation was that Ezra, who was the priest and the teacher of the law, would come to them and would bring, it says the book, so I don't know if book meant collection of scrolls, or, uh, but bring the book of the law of Moses that God commanded for the Israelites. And what do we see? You know, what we see <clears throat> is a sense of hunger and a sense of thirst from the people to learn. Actual fact, it says that he read 
from daybreak, now I don't know what daybreak was, I don't know necessarily, I didn't check kind of what season it was, until noon, he read from the book. Imagine this morning from sunrise until noon, I'm standing on this platform and all I'm doing is expounding and reading the word of God. How would you respond to that? But what do we see in their hearts? Hunger, thirst. It actually says that the people listened attentively from daybreak until noon. You know, in 2007, I don't know if we call it a calamity, happened in our society that has changed uh, things radically and has changed all of our lives profoundly. <clears throat> and that was the launch of the iPhone. Uh, it was the launch of the iPhone, but it also coincided with this thing called Facebook that became accessible to anybody, not just kind of a university community anymore, anybody that had access to the internet. Not only that, but that kind of spawned this revolution of social media, Twitter came about, what's it called now, X, I think, came about and, and that got going. You know, and now what sociologists would term is that we are deep into what they would call an epidemic of distraction. All the way back, I thought this was a recent, recent article, but all the way back in 2015, Tony Swartz, I think it was for uh, the New York Times, wrote a thought-provoking article entitling us as being addicted to distraction. That what has happened as a result, I won't just pin it on the iPhone, but what has happened as a result is that our brains have become so distracted that we have a craving for novelty and the whole time. As a result of that, a recent study in the Business Insider reported that the average iPhone user touches their phone no less than 2,670 times per day. Now, I know what the Android users are thinking in here. I know what CJ is thinking. He said, I knew that Apple is the problem. Now, just in case you have that wicked thought, I don't think iPhone is the problem. I think the smartphone might be the problem and I'll get this our attention span I don't know how you measure this but our attention span has dropped this is not encouraging from 12.5 seconds to 8 seconds before our brain craves for novelty we don't have a lot of room to lose anything more here I mean how do you go where do you go from 8 seconds so we're up against it now, I'm not saying we're victims here, but we are in an unprecedented time, living in an unprecedented society where our brains have become addicted to distraction when one of the biggest things that we battle is to listen attentively without craving novelty. Staying locked in and dialed in has become enormously difficult for us today. You know, the other thing that you see here in verse 5 says, as he opened the book, I could just kind of see it. You know, Ezra's there. It says, as he opened the book, I don't know if it was a co you know, co coordinated kind of event. Was, I've never read that you need to do this. But as he opened the book, it says, everybody stood up. The whole crowd raised to their feet. Men, women, anybody that could understand, raises to their feet. And then all of a sudden, he breaks out and he says, Praise be to the great God. And everybody shouts, lifts their hands, responds, amen, amen. And then it says, all of a sudden, everybody that's standing up, can you imagine this? Bows down with their face in worship to God. What a picture. You know, verse 7 it says the Levites, and then another list of names, instructed the people in the law while the people are standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest, and the scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, this day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping 
as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice foods and sweet drinks and send some of those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is our strength. The Levites calmed all the people saying, be still, for this is a sacred day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink and sent portions of food and to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that have been made known to them. I mean, you just continue to see. I love, I love sort of this, uh, and this is kind of a side note, you know, this, this, this collaboration between Nehemiah, that's the governor, you know, Ezra, that's the priest, the Levites, you see kind of team leadership, you know, happening here. But you see just the heart of people that are responding. On the one side, they're weeping as they listen to the words, maybe because they've realized this is why we went into exile, our disobedience, our rebellion. And then all of a sudden, they were persuaded to say, this is not a day to mourn, this is a day of great joy. And they went away and they were filled with great joy because all of a sudden, they understood what was being read to them and what was being explained. You know, and then from verse 13 onwards, we won't read this. The second day, they all come together again, they're reading the law. They discovered that one of the things they've neglected in the seventh month, which is the month that they were in, was that they have not celebrated the festival of tabernacles or the festival of booths, which was an annual festival that they had to celebrate where instead of living in your own home, or sleeping on your own bed, you, you were supposed to build a temporary shelter as a reminder that that is what your ancestors lived in as you came out of the exodus in the wilderness. So it was this incredible reminder of the great redemption story of God. When the people heard it in verse 16, I mean, you can just check it, it said, so the people went out and brought back branches and built themselves booths on their own roofs in their courtyards and the courts of the house of God and in the square by the water gate and the one by the gate of Ephraim. So not only did they hear the words, but all of a sudden they discovered some things that, that they've not been practicing, not been obeying, and there was this immediate response that, all right, we're going to do that. Can you imagine the picture in Jerusalem on that day? Where people deciding, I'm not going to live in this newly refurbished house that I've been working on since we've returned, but I'm going to build a temporary shelter so that I can be reminded of God's great redemption story. This is what's going on. And then in verse 18, it closes off the chapter, and it says, day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the feast, Feast of Tabernacles, for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulations, there was an assembly. So this goes on. Seven days, he's reading the book of the law. You know, I think when, when I think about building together for the future, one of the ways that my mind drifts and where I go is I can think about what are some old events that we need to bring back? Or maybe what are some new events that we need to start for the different ministries? I can think to myself, what are some structures in the church that either are non-existent that need to start, or what are some structures that should be tweaked for us to be able to, to operate more effectively? I definitely think about next generation leaders. I think about the next generation rising up and, uh, and, and taking their place and being handed responsibility at running on things. I can think about, you know, what are different ways for us uh, that we can reimagine how to do things that are fresh and creative and new and will inject faith into everybody that's part. Now, are those things needed? New events, old events brought back. Tweaking of structures. Uh, next generation leaders. All of those different things. Are those things needed? It's a resounding yes. We need to be able to reimagine. We need to be able to constantly think about how do we make things better individually, but also for us as a collective. But I think that there is a temptation that when we start thinking that way, if we don't work on the condition of our hearts, 
which basically boils down to my responsiveness, receptivity, passion, and eagerness around the Word of God, if we don't instill, reinvigorate, and have that, then we might be in danger of building something that is man-made but is not infused with the power of God. Should we reimagine those things? Absolutely, as we build together. But I want to encourage you and prod you, if we were to strip you away and just ask, what is your responsiveness like when the book is opened? What is that like for you? What is that like in, in the friend circle that you have? Is there eagerness, uh, a hunger, an attentiveness, and people that are in the word and being transformed by it. I think if we have those hearts and continue to have those hearts and we add those other things, man, that could be an exciting day. We don't have time for this, but in chapter 9, which is part of this climax, in verse 1 it says, On the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting, wearing sackcloth, and having dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all the foreigners. They stood in their places and confessed their sins and their wickedness of their fathers. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law, common theme, of, <coughs> of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day and spent another quarter in confession and worshiping the Lord their God. So it's the 24th of that same month, the seventh month. I mean, it must have been an electric month. They come together in assembly again and and quarter of the day, they are reading the word. Quarter of the day, they are confessing their sin and worshiping God. You see this heart, this palpable, responsive heart to it. And then what happens is the Levites break out in what I would consider to be a prayer <clears throat> in verse 5. But maybe, I, I think it was a prayer. I don't know if they did it jointly or maybe one individual. But this is what I would call a history prayer where the Levites recounted the story of God and what God has done. And the long and the short of it is that God has been faithful and we have been unfaithful. And that's why we went into exile. But praise be to God that we are back in the land. And that the high point of it is in verse 38. You can have a look there with me. In verse 38, as they conclude, it says, In view of all of this, this prayer, we are making a binding agreement putting it in writing, and our leaders, our Levites, and our priests are affixing their seals to it. And then it kind of gives <clears throat> a list of names. In verse 28, it says, And the rest of the people, priests, Levites, gatekeepers, singers, temple servants, and all who separated themselves from the neighboring people for the sake of the law of God, together with their wives and all their sons and their daughters, who are able to understand all these, now joined their brothers, the nobles, and binded themselves with a curse and an oath to follow the law of God given through Moses, the servant of God, and to obey carefully all the commandments, regulations, and decrees of the Lord their God. Ultimately, what happens here, it is a renewal of the covenant. It is entering back into the covenant that they've made. It is a pledge to be faithful to God. And then they make three very specific promises. I'm going to mention these to you. The first one is, we promise, it's in, the, it's in the scripture, but we don't have time. We promise not to give our daughters a marriage to people around us and take their daughters a marriage. Number two, when the neighboring people come on the Sabbath day to sell stuff, we won't buy it. We'll keep the gates shut. And number three, we will take responsibility to look after the house of God, the temple, give what we need to for all the offerings. We'll, we'll provide the wood for that fire to burn that we'll give our first fruits and our tithes to the Levites, we will not neglect the house of our God. I mean, this is it. Not only was the wall established, not only is the temple rebuilt, but this is it. It's the final restoration of Israel back in the land. The forgiven Israel will be the people who have hearts fully devoted to loving God and loving their neighbor. And then we arrive in chapter 13. Nehemiah heads back to Persia on a trip only to return to Jerusalem and find that every one of these commitments that they made at the covenant renewal has been compromised. 
that the temple has been neglected and defiled. People are violating the Sabbath command, and the problem of compromised marriages has gotten worse even since Ezra's day. And that's where we see Nehemiah lose it. Where he goes, picks a fight with some of the dudes, and literally starts ripping out people's hair, calling down curses on that assembly. That's how the story ends. Started with great hope, incredible possibility, but when we left <coughs> in chapter 13, that's where it sits. You know, before I close with some last remarks, when we stand back, let me say, what do I learn from this? I would say that when we look at Nehemiah as an individual, <clears throat> what do we see? I think when, when I was maybe younger in the faith, I would see him as the idyllic leader. I would see him as the man that I want to aspire to be. And, and, uh, and what we definitely see is a man filled with faith but also a man that is flawed. And maybe flawed is a strong word. Maybe, maybe the word is not perfect. I mean, goodness me, if I compare myself, my heart, my, my, my ability, my leadership ability to Nehemiah, if I could just be half the man that he was, it would be incredible. We find him in the beginning moved by compassion, putting up his hand saying, I, I, I'm willing to stand in the gap, leaving, being the cupbearer, cushy job, comfortable, and travel all the way back. We find him prayerful throughout the book of Nehemiah, constantly praying. We find him decisive, but inclusive. Where he's constantly gathering the team, saying, let's do this together. What is your role? How do we reestablish this? Decisive, but inclusive. We see him care incredibly about God's honor. God's honor was at stake. At stake, he would get involved. So we definitely see a, a man filled with faith, but he's not perfect. He's flawed. Now, does that mean that he should not have tried? That he should not have responded to the need? Or the fact that his leadership, the fact that his leadership achieved mixed results, looking at Nehemiah chapter 13, that he should rather not have gone involved? I don't believe that's the point. I think Nehemiah serves as an inspiring example to me and hopefully to you, of a flawed but faithful man partnering with God, doing his very best in his generation. And maybe that's the thing, as we think about the future and building together, that we need to note is that God partners with the willing, even if they're not perfect. You know, Laura and myself have been in Johannesburg for 11 years now, slightly longer than what we signed up for. We signed up for one year. When I say signed up, it's the wrong word. I mean, we were invited, we were eager to come, but, but, but initially it was a year, and here we are 11 years. All of those 11 years have been spent with you. Oh, somebody is excited. <laughs> I don't know. In those 11 years, I have made many, many mistakes. Sometimes through what I've said or actions that I've done. Sometimes, actually, the biggest mistake was not taking action and allowing certain things. Now, I can say to you that all of those mistakes were made non-maliciously, meaning I did not sit down and think about uh, what is a mistake that I can make? Most of that was done with sincerity, but they were mistakes. We don't have time to go through all of it, and I don't have time to listen to all of you saying, yes, now that, we, <laughs> now that we're on that. Sometimes our discouragement, disillusionment come from people not behaving the way that we expected or we thought that they would. Or that things in our lives or in the church is maybe not where we hoped it would be by now. And we have to work through that, if I'm honest. It, it is what it is. We have to work through that. 
Does that mean that we have to completely stop and not try again? Does that mean that I take my coat off and say, all right, man. Oh, I don't know. I'm going to put it back on. <laughs> I, I don't think that's the point. But I do think it would be amazing if we can create a culture where we can keep trying. Where, where it's, a, it's a group where the expectation is not, um, I don't want to say perfection, no one expects perfection, but, but, but it's, it's a culture and a place as we build for the future where um, when we've made mistakes, we can own them. We can admit them. Prayerfully, we can grow and learn from them and then try again. It would be amazing to create a culture as we build for the future where there is space for people that are battling in their faith. That have maybe gone through hurts and they need to work through it or they've, they themselves have made some mistakes. Maybe realized, maybe they haven't realized. And instead of being faced with judgment or people moving away, that we have a culture where we move towards one another. And we talk honestly because our expectation that we need to grow and we need to change and we need to repent and we need to be the best version so that, that God wants us to have, but to have a culture where we don't intentionally or subtly move away. But we fight to stay connected and maybe make a decision to reconnect with people that maybe we've lost touch with. And I'm thinking about individuals here, but potentially even churches in our amazing fellowship that maybe you know, across Southern Africa that we have gotten disconnected from. And, and many of you serve as ligaments for those groups. It'd be amazing to have a culture when, when we talk about build together, that we are intentional. But yes, we're going to be filled with faith, but, but God works with flawed people. We have a culture where people can try again. You know, the other thing, and I'll leave you with this, that, that the book of Nehemiah absolutely demonstrates is God's faithfulness. You know, the fact that this group can be back from exile in the land is a fulfillment of the prophecies and promises that God made to them. That must have been, standing in Jerusalem, I think he must have just been so overwhelmed that this is exactly what Jeremiah spoke about. And here we are. Pagan kings have opened up ways for us to reestablish our temple and rebuild the wall. How does this work? It works because God's hand was at work. And that's why we find the statement, the gracious hand of God was on me. God had put it on my heart. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. And as mentioned earlier in chapter 6, 16, after the completion of the wall, it was clear that what was done here was done with the help of our God. Faithful, faithful, faithful. I'm not 94 years old spiritually, <laughs> but today, I don't know how this works, I always end up preaching on my spiritual birthday. Today I am 23 years old as a disciple. You know, in some sense, it feels like yesterday when I came out of the waters at um, Woodbridge Island in Cape Town and, and uh, the tide washed my sin away. In another, in another sense, it really feels quite long. It's a lot that's happened. But I can tell you this, and I think we have to remind one another of this as we build together, that God is faithful. It's His nature. He will continue to be faithful. As we end our reflection here, thinking back to how the narrative of the Old Testament ends in Nehemiah chapter 13, it is really revealing about the human condition. Apparently, the disaster of the exile did not accomplish the transformation of the human heart. Even grave consequences don't bring about the deep level of healing required to change the human disposition. Israel's problem before the exile was a hard heart, 
that resulted in rebellion against the terms of their covenant with God. And Israel's problem after the exile, well, it was exactly the same. What this tells us with where the narrative is at the moment is that the new covenant promises of Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 30, 36 had yet to be fully realized and that even though the Israelites are back in their ancestral land at this point in time, they are still in exile spiritually speaking. And when we turn to the opening pages of the New Testament and find John the Baptist going down to the Jordan River where Israel first entered the land, things should click. He's trying to lead a new return from exile, but the real return this time. That's why his baptism was a movement of repentance and forgiveness. You can have a look in Mark chapter 1. John knew, as did Jesus, that God's covenant people truly needed wasn't just a new temple building or a new city wall. They needed new hearts that could truly respond to God's love and grace with grateful devotion. My prayer is that we will be praying to have those hearts individually and as a collective, we can think about building for the future together. God bless. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Pastor Jack, for a great message. Really, what a, what a powerful message in Nehemiah. I hope we'll all go back and, and, and uh, go through it again and learn. And uh, what an, uh, uh, I think one thing I can say about God, he's, he's got such uh, amazing grace for all of us uh, because we mess up each and every day. And uh, if he was anything like Nehemiah 13, I think all the brothers would be bold. So we are so grateful for how and what God is to us. Uh, we're going to stand and sing one more song. The song is just a. to two.
Yeah.